is introducing our, our speaker to you today. We have uh, Glenn Miller here, and I think many of you know him. He's with the uh, Canadian Urban Institute. His background uh, is in um, urban studies and planning, um, and to, he's been working on age-friendly cities and related kinds of topics for over 10 years now. And so he'll, he'll be giving us some insights and raising some questions. Uh, he's also a fellow of the Canadian Institute of uh, Planners, and he was the, uh, still is, or was the editor for the Ontario... No, we gave it up. Gave it up, okay. The uh, editor for the Ontario Planning Journal, where some of these debates, he's been able to kind of open up uh, some of these debates through uh, that journal. Do you want to say a few words of uh, hello, or shall we start well, off? Well, I, I think, uh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, um, thanks very much for inviting me. Um, well, there we go. Okay. Well, thank you again for that, Amanda. Yeah, I'm a delight to be here and look forward to a uh, close held uh, discussion. Um, it, you mentioned that I've been looking at these issues for, for, for 10 years. When we started um, doing presentations on aging issues, uh, my colleagues and I that I started doing this with, we referred to ourselves as seniors in training. And uh, I have to say that we actually graduated. Uh, and, uh, um, anyway, so um, come on in as a chair, anywhere you like. So, um, first of all, let me ask you uh, who has heard of the Canadian Urban Institute? Isn't that nice? <laughs> Uh, that, well, that's great. So uh, this is our 25th year of operation, which for a little non-profit, uh, which was started by the City of Toronto and Metro Toronto from just over 25 years ago, um, is, is a bit of a feat. Um, the, the reason we call the Canadian Urban Institute is that we started out, uh, apparently, with the idea of being the Toronto Urban Institute. And the federal government heard about it and said, well, if you change the name to Canadian, We'll fund you. <laughs> so we changed the name, and they forgot about the funding. So, so, but the good news is that means that we've had to be very entrepreneurial. And uh, the work that we've, uh, as it says here, 95%, and I can use the smart word, I feel like I'm on CNN. So, uh, so, so th this is what I'm going to cover today. Um, I'm going to leave out, out, out the, uh, the uh, thunderstorms and, and, the, and the earthquakes and we'll leave that to CNN. Um, I'm going to cover really three points and just end up with a, um, a plug for a particular uh, interest of mine. Um, go into some of the reasons why I think we need to pay attention to aging and I think the fact that you're all here, you, you, you probably agree with that. Um, and uh, we've done some desktop research on uh, how age-friendly uh, is happening across uh, the province. And I uh, would like to give you some preliminary uh, results of that. And um, I've got some suggestions on how we might better integrate uh, age-friendly thinking into the mainstream planning process. And um, I, I think it's, it's interesting to note that there's no shortage of commentary about aging, uh, but in my view, not enough uh, focus on the built environment. I don't know what So, why do we need to pay attention to aging? I think these, this, this picture is actually in Calabria, and I cannot imagine living and then losing my driving license. We'll, 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 we'll get to that. Um, it's a bit of an issue. So some of you may have seen these, these slides before. Um, when, uh, 1961, only one in 14 of us was over the age of 65. So it really wasn't a, a huge issue. But the good news is that somebody was thinking ahead in, in Ottawa, and we've had old age security since uh, 1927. Um, 1957, they ushered in registered retirement savings plans and then the Canada Pension Plan. And um, in our um, report that we did for the Region of Waterloo, which I'll, I'll, I'll send you the link, um, we, we actually have a chapter that looks at, at the trajectory of uh, how uh, the, the, uh, the, the federal government in particular has, has, has sort of moved into uh, 
funding aging from a, from a health perspective. And uh, we'll, we'll get to some of the, uh, of what I think are the missing links. So um, looking ahead, uh, in not too many years from now, uh, one, one quarter of the population is going to be over the age of 65. But I don't think that uh, 65 is, is what we should really be concerned about, because 65 is not as old as it used to be. I can say that. Um, uh, I, I use this to sort of help you imagine uh, what it will be like. Nearly one and a half million people over the age of 85, which if you put them all in three places, these are three cities, imagine what a city would be like where everybody is over, over that age. Uh, and uh, so it uh, gets different reactions from, from, from different groups. Mm -hmm. does, does that help you sort of imagine what it would be like to be in a city where there's just a lot of people? And I, I think we need to focus on, on 85. So this is, this is interesting because this is a report done by <coughs> Municipal Affairs um, uh, in 1983. And I sh should have mentioned that the Urban Futures, I don't know if you've come across their work, they're based on that. Um, they do some very interesting work on the housing, how, how people are going to be housed. And they estimate that between 2014 and 2041, the uh, cohort of 85 plus is going to increase by 145%. That's a rate of increase. So here we have a picture of how seniors were portrayed in 1983. And although this is only a photocopy, I think you can see that uh, it probably isn't how we see ourselves today. It, it's, it's sort of uh, evocative. Um, so it's good news, bad news. The good news is, is that the uh, report identified many of the things that we're still talking about. People want to stay in places they're familiar with. Uh, the need for transportation, the issue of mobility is, is key. Uh, and they saw a need for increased, increased focus on home care. The one thing that they probably uh, didn't get right is they said that people who can drive, they're independent, they can take care of themselves. So, and I think that's, that's where my interest uh, comes in. So that the perception uh, of, of aging has changed. So um, a very quick <coughs> diversion into some of the bigger picture issues. Um, uh, uh, looking at uh, 2041, um, we already have more people over the age of 65 than school children. You probably saw the, the great fuss uh, in September when, uh, I'm surprised the sky didn't fall. It was just like, oh my gosh, the, uh, we've got more seniors than, than school age children. Um, and that of course affects uh, working age uh, population and the dependency ratio. When uh, the present Prime Minister's father was uh, in uh, the Prime Minister, the dependency ratio was apparently was about 7 to 1. I understand it's about 5 to 1 today, and it's heading uh, to 2 to 1. So what that does is it changes the dynamics of how policy is uh, established and, and what the priorities are going to be uh, for, for those implementing uh, those, those, those policies. We had... Um, yeah, I've actually got the, the numbers here. It's a very close run thing. It, um, it, it's down to a few thousand, but it, 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 we still make the, uh, the, the change. So this is, um, I say this is a diversion, but it's, it's actually interesting if you're interested in how municipalities uh, keep the lights on. Um, because uh, one of the things that uh, we see happening is that uh, We've grown our urban areas. We're very much a suburban nation. David Gordon at Queens has written uh, very interesting uh, pieces on this, um, calling ourselves a, a, a suburban nation. So generally speaking, we're getting fewer greenfield subdivisions and people are moving towards multifamily um, dwellings, uh, whether they're condominiums or, or apartments, sometimes by choice, sometimes because they can't make those initial uh, purchases to get on that particular treadmill. Um, yeah, the work that we did for uh, Waterloo and I don't remember where the glasses are. Um, so
So in um, 2003, just to give you an idea, uh, 2003, 13% of new residential growth uh, was already in the, um, uh, the built up area. And by uh, 2013, it had increased to 55%. So that means a lot of infill, a lot of different types of, of, of housing. Now, why this is of great interest to the, the financial uh, wizards at uh, municipalities is the model that municipalities have built their, their growth on is dependent on uh, uh, development charge uh, revenues and, and property taxes linked to um, basically a greenfield subdivision. And so if you get your bet wrong as to how you're going to fund your infrastructure, um, uh, then uh, it starts to be a bit of a problem uh, financially. And regional Waterloo has uh, actually went to court over this, um, and that's part of a longer conversation that we could have afterwards if you like. So, um, one more thought about the fiscal impact of, of aging. Um, a report came out a couple of years in Peel region, 70% of people who are already over the, seven, uh, over the age of 75 have these very small incomes, 30,000 uh, people. So the, there's actually a misperception. People think in Peel, very, very wealthy area, um, not necessarily. Uh, and people who are uh, aged and living by themselves uh, find themselves in hardship. And we'll talk a little bit more about this one. Uh, the, the Ministry of Transportation estimates that only uh, 40% in places like Peel, around the GTA, these car dependent areas will have driving licenses by 2036. So, uh, as my friend Gordon Harris at uh, uh, Simon Fraser uh, Community Trust uh, famously said, the suburbs are no place to grow old. And, you know, we've all seen these pictures of, of endless, uh, homogeneous uh, suburbs that are very difficult to get around in any other way uh, by car than by car. So we've been working on um, building car dependent um, uh, areas. We, we've been focused on commuting. Um, one of the things that we brought out in, in the study that we did with the region of Waterloo is when mobility issues start to become uh, at, the, at the scale that we're, we're starting to see in terms of uh, <coughs> people losing their mobility, then it becomes a public policy issue. And, and so, and, and I think that's maybe, that's something that we can talk about afterwards. Uh, so we built these car dependent, this is a great fun, this book, by the way. We built car dependent uh, car, um, uh, workplaces, car dependent shopping, yeah. and, you can just feel the pain, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, invested in these car-dependent suburbs that we that we've been uh, mentioning, uh, particularly like this one, let's say, Rainbow Valley Crescent. Well, if you live on Rainbow Valley Crescent and you need to get to uh, somewhere to buy uh, some milk, um, you better be uh, very fit or or have a car. So here's this uh, this uh, picture. Does anybody uh, recognize this sliver of street here? Anybody from the Don Mills area? Mm -hmm. yeah. Hope this isn't your grandma. Uh, <laughs> so so you, you you know Don Mills? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You probably recognize the cracks in the sidewalk here. Yeah. They they've been getting um, steadily worn. Uh, and of course, this is a very uh, tricky problem for people uh, with walkers and, and scooters. Um, and so the maintenance costs are quite huge. Um, a colleague of mine, uh, uh, Christian Fisker, who works with Chartwell, which is one of the <coughs> companies that are in the business, um, he uh, got this great stat from the Ministry of Transportation, 42% um, of people over the age of 50, 75. So these are people currently in their 50s, in their early 60s, and in 10 minutes from now, in sort of demographic terms, they're not going to have, a lot of them are not going to have driving license. So what are we going to do? How are we going to deliver services to them? Uh, will municipalities actually uh, strain to uh, deliver services uh, to people um, at home? It's uh, a big challenge. So this is um, 
I like this graphic because it, it, it helps me remember the importance of universal design. Universal design, as you probably know, was invented to overcome uh, physical barriers at a sort of very small scale. But I think it's actually very interesting, as part of a, another presentation, how you can scale it up to, uh, to the neighborhood scale. So here we have challenges at the, at the house scale. This is the neighborhood, and this is the city, and this is uh, the world around you. And um, one of the things I discovered when we, when we first started uh, researching this is one of the reasons for the popularity of cruises. It, does anybody know why, why Denise? Oh, why it's popular? Mm. Um, because you, you get everything you need and you, you don't have to pack and unpack. And uh, yeah, and, and they're fed and watered and entertained. And, uh, and there's mobile, people, tons of people with walkers and wheelchairs on this. That's <laughs> right. And, and that, 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 that's another motivator, which is unless you have a, a long term relationship with the, uh, with the car rental company, uh, over a certain age, you can't uh, easily rent. Um, Oh, okay. Okay. So that that's one of the hidden uh, things that, that's happening. So uh, um, you know you, you've all heard of 880. Uh, so when you're eight years old, your your world is, is around your, your your neighborhood, and then maybe when you're 80 or 90, um, it's it, your your focus is is is, is back on that. So um, this is a definition of mobility that I think is. Uh, it's quite touching because it covers all the bases. Um, you have to be able to, if you want to go somewhere, you've got to be able to do it. You've got to be able to afford uh, to do it. You've got to know how to understand the, uh, the cues. I mean, coming to this campus today, um, I came extra early, and I'm really glad I did. I just hope I can find the car again. <laughs> uh, and I hope I interpreted the, um, the instructions on this very strange uh, parking machine. Um, and it, 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 it's interesting that the, the, it, it's all, uh, you have to put your license number in. And of course, I have an auto share car today, so oh, I don't yeah. typically take a car to work. So cars over there, yeah. machines over here. Uh, I hope I got the license from the panel. Um, so let, let's talk a little bit about why we need to be mobile. Um, so if, if you're looking at this, this is, this is walking, slightly um, different type of walking with a walker, bicycle, bus stop, and then the car. And obviously your, aid, your ability to, to move around uh, a neighborhood or a city is going to depend a lot on uh, on how, what your own capabilities are. And, but there's all of these are just sort of the, the top of line reasons for why you want to be mobile and you want to uh, make sure that you're um, interested in, in going out. This is from the Ministry of Transportation. Uh, the Transportation Tomorrow Survey uh, looks at, uh, at uh, transportation um, modal split, the, 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 the whether people are taking cars, whether they're taking transit, whether they're cycling, whether they're walking. And uh, this is uh, a fairly recent uh, stat that they have. And what's interesting is you see uh, this is uh, car travel, independent car travel. And uh, as people um, start to age, they start to, oops, hello. <laughs> uh, they start to, um, CNN test. Uh, they, they, they start to uh, be more comfortable taking uh, trips as passengers. Uh, and of course, we know that that's great if you've got somebody willing to drive it. Um, that uh, raises a whole, whole bunch of issues. So, this, this is almost a, a very symmetrical view of, of long term uh, uh, transportation stats that I, I think is, is, is quite instructive. Um, Martin Turcott uh, works for the federal government. His piece, his, has anybody read his, his stuff on uh, mobility? It's absolutely terrific. He's um, accessible uh, thanks to Google. Uh, he's written a number of very, very interesting pieces uh, about mobility, particularly about what happens when, when you no longer can drive. But one of the things that he's um, pointed out is that uh, men, for some reason, um, uh, the rate of transit use uh, drops off to about 4%. So 
So this fellow is a member of the Pepsi generation. Yeah. Thank you. Some people, some people remember the. Um, uh, uh, the I, I, I'm not going to be able to use that line. In, uh, so, um, so uh, Sandra Rosenblum is uh, an American academic who has written uh, extensively, been published by the Transportation Research Board. Does really, really excellent work, and she's um, made this connection uh, between. Uh, your propensity to use transit and uh, how long, uh, if you've ever used transit. And there are places in the states where people have never taken public transit. And so one of the things that the, the seniors um, are encouraged to do is take classes and have to take yeah. public transit. Yes. Um, take the bus. This, uh, and of course, if you don't have the ability to get out, um, uh, you uh, tend to be stuck in one place. Um, so this is something that we wrote about in this uh, report, and I'll, I guess I'll have to give you the link um, uh, for this uh, study for uh, Region of Waterloo. Region of Waterloo, is anybody from Waterloo? No. Do you have any friends who are from Waterloo? <laughs> right, that's a little bit. Yes, sorry. Some of my best friends are from Waterloo. Um, one of the things that they've done and are doing is they're trying to make the Region of Waterloo more transit friendly. So we were asked to look at how the idea of transit friendly and age friendly fits together. And it isn't a perfect fit, uh, but obviously there's some over overlap. And so we took uh, some ideas that are um, uh, in the literature, uh, the five A's, availability, uh, accessibility, acceptability, uh, affordability, and adaptability. And that's a just a different way of saying some of the things that uh, we were talking about earlier. And I think the, um, um, just to give you a bit more detail, so availability, um, what's, what's the transit service like in often periods? As I said earlier, most of our transit service is geared towards uh, commuting. Um, you've got to be able to reach the transit, uh, it's got to be easy to board, and the people um, who are piloting the uh, the buses have to be considerate. Mm -hmm. There's a great program uh, that was uh, started in Leeds in, in Northern England, um, and uh, it's called the full, full Quality Package. And back in the days when low-floor buses were, were new to the scene, uh, the engineers who were in charge of um, uh, the Leeds transit system sort of <coughs> did what was logical to them, and they put buses here, buses there, buses there. And the old people who were part of their panel that they were in discussion with, they said, don't be down. They found out where they, the older people are and put the transit where they were. The sort of, and anyway, the result was they, um, they increased the uh, level of uh, transit use by older people by double digits. And they did a whole bunch of things also. They, they trained the drivers so that the uh, you, you, will, you will all be on buses where an old person gets on and the first thing that, does, that happens is the bus jerks off and the old person falls over. Yeah. They never take the bus again, right? Because they get embarrassed. Um, so affordability, uh, you've got to be able to, to get there. The, um, there are a number of uh, shopping centers that run uh, shuttles to uh, senior citizens' homes and things, but that can be expensive for people on, on, on a budget. So it, it's got to be uh, affordable and it's got to be adaptable. Uh, one of the things that happens if it's done too well is that more people start to use the transit and there isn't room for the, the old people. So you uh, be careful what you wish for. So here are some preliminary results. This is on the cover of our uh, piece that we've done for um, the region of Waterloo, and uh, yes, it is Abbey Road. Uh, and uh, we are trying to get permission uh, to uh, use the image. At the moment, we just borrowed it from the internet. Um, but there's a story behind this, which is, uh, which I think is, uh, it's very British. It's, it's, it's quite entertaining. The um, the British, the BBC producer who arranged this. Um, was friends with a record producer uh, at Abbey Road, 
and they assembled what they claimed to be the oldest rock band in the world. And the assembled uh, cast uh, had a, 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 a cumulative age of 3,000 years. And it's available on YouTube. I encourage you to look at it. And you see all these people with the earphones and, and in front of the, the microphone singing My Generation. It's fantastic. <laughs> it's, it's fantastic. It's um, called Oldest Rock Band World. It's YouTube. Um, you go to YouTube and you say uh, Abbey Road, uh, aging, and then you, you, you'll, you'll, you'll find your way there. Anyway, so we're trying to get permission to use this image on, on the cover of our, our report because uh, I think it, um, it's uh, kind of like. So um, we, we do some work with uh, this is a rather odd sounding group, Lunco. Um, the chair, uh, the, uh, the mayor of Barry is in charge of Lunco at the moment. That one of his priorities is to find a better acronym. Um, so it stands, it stands for Large Urban Mayors Caucus of Ontario, and there's 27 cities, and uh, nine of these cities have uh, higher than the provincial average. And what's interesting, I'm just doing some double checking. Ontario's uh, average, uh, the, the, the average. Uh, of people over the age of 65 is about 14 and a half percent in 2014, and it's about 15 percent now. And nationally, it gets about 16 uh, percent. And, and I think that has to do with uh, the, the fact that we have uh, some larger cities in Ontario where there's more people coming uh, from, uh, from outside. And uh, uh, so a different uh, dynamic going on. So these cities have um, the, these higher uh, 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 proportions of, uh, of older uh, citizens. And um, St. Catharines just got a, a new Horizons grant, and they, uh, they're doing some more work. Uh, Chatham-Kent uh, is a very different setting, uh, quite rural. Um, so some of the similar issues that you would find in Hamilton, I imagine. And Thunder Bay, uh, Northern Ontario has a whole different set of issues because one of the challenges they have in Northern Ontario, anybody from Northern Ontario? There you go. <laughs> um, uh, is, is holding on to youth. Yeah. And so it doesn't take a, a, a genius to know that you have people leaving and people returning and aging in the, in the community, so you're going to have a higher proportion. Harry Sound is already 26%. So, um, so one of the things we looked at was um, 27 cities, all very different, some fast growing. Ajax, Brampton, Milton, Whitby, these are all places that are still doing the single, the, the single family subdivisions. But what's interesting is that they already have started to engage in the age friendly discussion. Um, they've uh, got 10% or less of their population is over the age of 65, but they've already started that, that process and they've got grants from the Ontario Senior Secretariat to, to help them do that. So good for them. Um, 18 cities already have either an older adult strategy or an age-friendly action plan. Hamilton has been doing this for a long time, as, as, uh, as you all know. Um, so, Brantford, Cambridge, Chenkin, well, Hamilton, London, so South Carolina, West Carolina Bay, uh, receive uh, Ontario Seniors uh, grants to do more work. Um, Barry, Burlington, Markham, Vaughan, and Whitby are just beginning. And there's only three cities, uh, Oakville, Oshawa, and Richmond Hill, uh, that haven't um, actually said we want to be age friendly. So, Burlington has stopped and started a couple times, right? Eh? So well, they got the, the grant just recently, but there's they a, just got a grant. Yeah. There's a but the there is a age friendly Burlington group that's been working for a number of years and originally United Way. Just and I only make the point because when it's driven by municipalities, you know, there's a there's a stop and start kind of pattern, unfortunately, right. trying to get political buy-in. So they were they were doing it when I was six or seven years ago, and then stop, start, stop, start. And so right. Well, they're next door to Oakville, and we've been very similar uh, demographic, so yeah. it, 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 it's interesting. Yeah. And as I say, this is just desktop research, what yeah. you can glean from the internet. 
And uh, what we'd like to do is actually do some interviews to, to, to drill down a little bit. Thanks for pointing that out, Denise. So um, when you look at who, what you might call the drivers are for uh, age-friendly uh, activity, it's the community and social services departments, social planning councils, uh, the, the, a lot of the uh, grant money is, is going to places that are pursuing, um, uh, that are being driven by departments of recreation. Uh, we were looking at, at, at one municipality where um, we thought we'd be interested in doing some work there, and they explicitly said, we're not interested in transportation or housing, we just want to focus on recreation. Mm -hmm. So, okay. uh, so um, regional governments have actually been quite uh, uh, active uh, in the area. Um, but there's very few municipal planning departments uh, that have taken an active role in, uh, in becoming age-friendly. And I think that's really what I'm interested in trying to change. Um, so these uh, cities have 